thank you, like Caroline and you know all the other organizers for putting um, yeah BCon together. It is uh, one of my favorite conferences. Um, just all B stuff. It's fantastic. Uh, and yeah, um, like Caroline said, today I'm going to be talking about quantifying the impact of neonicotinoids and new generation insecticides on bee health. So neonicotinoids are probably uh, familiar to, to most people listening to this talk, um, and that is because they are the most commonly used insecticide in the world, and they're in the media um, a lot. Um, they're the most commonly used insecticide in the world for two main reasons. The first being that they're systemic. This means that when a neonicotinoid is purchased um, as a spray treatment or a seed treatment, when it's uh, used on a crop, because it's systemic, it gets to all parts of the crop, which is highly advantageous. Um, if you are trying to defend your crop from insect pests. And the second um, important factor is that they specifically target the insect's nervous system, which reduces the potential impact on vertebrate wildlife and humans. Again, highly advantageous. Um, one of the potential downsides of the neonicotinoid is also its strengths. Um, the systemic element of it means that it also, they also get into the nectar and pollen of treated crops, such as um, canola where bees and other pollinators can come into contact with it. Now, there's a whole host of um, research out there now showing that neonicotinoids can have sublethal impacts on bees. They can influence things like learning, foraging efficiency, homing ability, ovary development and, colon and the colony initiation, um, but also reproductive output. Now, neonicotinoids might not necessarily have lethal consequences um, on bees at field realistic levels, but some of these sublethal impacts are really important, the most obvious one being reproductive output. If a pesticide, whatever it might be, if it kills a, pest, um, kills a bee, that bee will have no fitness. But if it impairs its reproduction from the sake of fitness and the number of bees going into the next generation, the effect of, is, is the same, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter um, from a fitness point of view. So some of these sublethal impacts are really, really important. And um, because of the, the, this kind of growing body of evidence, neonicotinoids have now been banned in the EU. Um, they're still the pesticide of um, choice across much of the world, including um, here in the US, where I I'm now currently based. And uh, it's perhaps not surprisingly, the pesticide companies weren't too pleased about their, their products being banned in the EU. Um, so Bayer, in this particular case, got into a legal dispute uh, with the EU over the restrictions uh, on neonicotinoid use um, earlier this year. But the EU upheld the ban on neonicotinoid uses, uh, use. And um, one of the things they, they cited was the relationship um, and the potential impact of neonicotinoids on bees. Again, not surprisingly, Bayer in this particular instance and pesticide companies more broadly um, continue to stand by the safety profile of neonicotinoids, of their products. Um, which again, you can you completely understand why they would do that. And um, yeah, there's a lot of vested interest here. There's a lot of money being spent on developing these insecticides. When they talk about the safety profile of their insecticides in relation to bees, they're very keen to do two things. When talking about sublethal impacts, they quite often suggest that the concentrations used in these experiments that have demonstrated these sublethal effects are above those levels that would occur in the field. So the higher dosages than, than you would find in an agricultural environment. And of course, there's some truth to this. There are some experiments that have done this, but there are also several others, which are at which are field realistic levels, which I'll circle back to later. Um, the second thing they're very keen to do is focus on honeybees. Now, this is for a whole host of different reasons. Honeybees are really important. They're used as the model species within the regulatory process. We have the most data on them. But... They are a bit of an oddity in the bee world, as everybody at BeeCom will already know. And um, they live in huge colonies, managed by humans for the most part, and 50,000 workers. They appear to be more robust to neonicotinoid exposure than um, non apis bees. That's not to say that there aren't studies showing that neonicotinoids have a negative effect on honeybees. There, there are several, but it seems that wild bees, bumblebees, solitary bees appear to be more vulnerable. So one of the things I was keen to do was um, conduct a meta-analysis on the sub-lethal impacts of neonicotinoids on non apis bees. So a meta-analysis, um, for anybody who doesn't know, is basically where you go back through the literature, you extract as much data as you can, and you combine it all in one um, big analysis. So I did literature search, and I was able to collect 212 effect sizes that had looked at the impact, the sublethal impact of neonicotinoids on 
non-HSBs. This data um, came from the last two decades, and importantly, I only extracted data, effect sizes, I only extracted this data when um, the dosages used were considered field realistic. Now, by field realistic, I'm referring to um, known levels of neonicotinoids um, in crops which have been treated, be attractive crops which have been treated with neonics. So in re relation to field realism, the, all the data I'm about to show you is um, um, field realistic. And this um, forest plot here is going to fill up with data as I talk you through it. Anything to the left-hand side of the zero line here, where the confidence intervals do not touch the zero line, suggests an overall negative effect. So we can see here at the top of this graph, we can see that there was an overall negative effect of neonicotinoid exposure on reproductive output. That's things like male production, queen production, brood production, um, neonicotinoids impaired um, reproductive output. Colony growth, um, all this data it was to do with bumblebees. It was a bumblebee worker, weight colony gain, for example. Um, neonicotinoids impaired bumblebee colony growth. We found no overall effect on individual development. That's things like individual um, weight gain um, for a bee. And we did find an overall negative effect on bumblebee foraging. This is um, all this data is related, related to pollen foraging. So as I said before, all this data um, uh, was extracted from experiments which exposed bees to field realistic concentrations of neonicotinoids. Um, and obviously I'm biased, I did this study, but I, I do think it's really clear, robust evidence that neonicotinoids do have these sublethal effects on non apis bees. Um, something that I would like to point out, this is a busy table, I don't expect anybody to consume it all, but 75% of the data that we extracted was from bumblebees. Um, so solitary bees and uh, bee species more generally are, are really poorly represented and, and obviously require further research. Now, I just want to take a step back and talk about how pesticides are regulated. Now, obviously, this is different in different countries and different um, government bodies, but this um, Triangle here is a very, very crude um, reflection of pesticide regulation. At tier one, um, you conduct lab experiments, LD50 experiments for the most part. This is the only part of the uh, regulatory process that is mandatory. LD50 experiments are basically used to determine how much of an active ingredient is required to kill 50% of a population. Um, and it's always done, we are pretty much always done with honeybees. Based on those findings, further tier two studies will or will not be conducted. So if they are conducted, they will be semi-field experiments for the most part. Um, this is where cages are used, flowers um, are put in the cages which have and have not been treated with a pesticide. And then um, sublethal considerations, reproductive output foraging might be considered here in tier two. And tier three might be carried out if there's still questions about the insecticide, but it's very rare to, to, for, for tier three to be carried out. This is field experiments. And it's best to kind of focus on tier one and tier two. Now, importantly, sublethal effects on non apis bees are not considered um, until tier two. Uh, so there's no mandatory requirement to um, perform these um, experiments. So we have a situation where a novel insecticide might be licensed with similar sublethal effects. And that's where sulfoxiflor comes in. So Foxiflor is um, a similar pesticide to neonicotinoids in a sense that it targets the insect's nervous system. It is systemic, but it is chemically distinct from neonicotinoids, um, which means it's effective at targeting pests which are resistant to neonicotinoids. I first started looking at this in 2017, and I found that when I um, reared bumblebee colonies with and without a field realistic dose of sulfoxiflor, that there was a 54% reduction in the number of bumblebees, uh, males and queens produced by colonies exposed to sulfoxiflor. Now, I hope that that was an important study, but it was just one study. So I um, last year decided to conduct a meta-analysis on sulfoxiflor and beneficial insects more broadly. So that's bees, but also predatory insects such as ladybirds and lacewings. Um, I also wrote a review paper on it. And this is what we found. So if you look at the uh, bottom of this graph, you can see the overall effects. This is uh, the overall effect of sulfoxiflor on beneficial insects. And you can see that there's an overall negative effect of the insecticide on beneficial insects. When we break that down into different dependent variables, we can see that there was an effect on mortality, an effect on fitness, queen production, male production, 
Um, but we didn't find an effect on behavior, which is interesting, but also I'd point out that we had an N of nine for that independent variable, so um, a, a reduced sample size. But importantly, we found that these effects were occurring when bees were exposed to field realistic levels of sulfoxiflor. Um, these effects occurred across pollinators and predatory insects more broadly. So I've gone through that data quite quickly. There's a lot of information there, but overall, what we basically have is we have a situation where sulfoxiflor, a novel, novel insecticide, appears to have similar sublethal effects on beneficial insects, including bees, um, to those um, observed of neonicotinoids. Now, you could give a whole series of presentations about how to future-proof pesticide regulation, but two things that I really, I think are really, really crucial for pesticide regulation in the future are sublethal assessments on native wild bees, bumblebees and solitary bees. And importantly, these need to be conducted, in my opinion, within tier one um, to ensure that um, we don't have a situation where we are licensing insecticides uh, for use without having a good understanding of their potential sublethal impacts on uh, wild bees. Um, something that I haven't touched on, that is, but is also really important, is understanding how these agrochemicals interact with other anthropogenic stressors, poor nutrition, parasites, other insecticides. Um, and if you're interested in that, I've, I've written more about that uh, in, in an op-ed that was published in The Hill uh, last year. Um, last to say, thank you for all of you for listening. Uh, thank you to all these wonderful people for helping me and uh, the organizers for putting this conference together and uh, my funders, obviously, as well. Thanks. Okay, let's try this again. Um, thank you so much, Harry, and sorry so much for that beginning and awkward introduction. Hopefully everyone can hear me now, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or to leave it in the Q&A. I'll give it a second. I do have one hand up from Ellen Richard. Uh, Ellen, feel free to unmute yourself. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, that works. Okay, excellent. Um, so yeah, uh, just this is kind of like a broader question that you might not even be able to answer, but. Uh, I mean, I would expect that all pesticides that come out are going to have negative effects on insects in general, as that is their main role. So I guess it's more about determining like which ones are better at being target specific with their pesticide um, targeting. Because I feel like we just ban one pesticide that's bad and it just comes out with more pesticides that are bad and it's just a game of which pesticide is worse um just like what are your thoughts and comments on that i guess yeah i mean you're preaching to the preaching to the choir i mean yeah that's what my whole phd thesis is on um yeah we have this kind of continuing cycle where pesticide gets licensed for use we do a couple of decades of research and then it gets banned and then another pesticide gets licensed for use. Um, the important thing about what we're trying to do in these meta-analysis and our research more broadly is, is make it feel realistic. Um, but yeah, it, so I, I would, I mean, it's kind of like a too big a question really to answer in the two or three minutes we have here, but there's a lot that could be done at pesticide regulation, not just um, considering the kind of toxicity and sublethal impacts of pesticides, but also how persistent they are in the environment. If you have a pesticide which um, is able to um, effectively target a pest species, but then disappears very quickly. That would be highly advantageous, but does that exist at the moment? I don't know. Um, I, I, my research is pretty much focused on these sort of novel insecticides and neonicotinoids. So you're completely right. The system does need to be looked at. And yeah, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. But if, but if you do want to chat more about it, I'll happily... I don't think I have long enough to get into that really long-winded sort of <laughs> response, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, that was a very like generic kind of like open-ended. It was just like, I don't know, I get to the end of that talk and I feel like I've heard other talks that are similar to this talking about neonicotinoids and their effects and it just so easily ends up 
coming to the same question. So yeah, I'd be happy to chat outside of this because um, it is it is a hard question to answer. Um, but I'm sure you've thought about it a lot yeah. and probably more than I have. So it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, the paper I linked at the end, uh, the Prop B review we just wrote on novel insecticides, and we, 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 we list a few suggestions to how regulation could be changed to better safeguard bees in that review piece. Um, yeah, amongst other things, I've written a piece for the conversation and yeah, for the Hill, which I mentioned all about pesticide regulation, suggested changes um, as well.